Without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker uh, for this conference, for our inaugural conference, Ambassador Louis Lukitz. Good evening. Thanks, um, everyone, for coming out on a beautiful Monterey afternoon. I want to thank and acknowledge all the hard work that the organizers of this event have put into this inaugural conference. Alessandro and Darina and um, Terry, thanks to you also. It's always a pleasure for me to come to the Middlebury Institute for International Studies at Monterey. Excellent recruiting territory for the State Department. Lots of young people who are engaged with the world and ready and able to tackle some of the most difficult challenges in this hyper-connected, complicated world of ours. There are certainly many ways for each and every one of you to get out in the world and make a positive difference, and I encourage all of you to consider a career in public service. We need people like you, smart, energized, and globally aware, involved in our po policy formulation and execution. It's especially heartening to see this group, the Students for Ethical Governance and Policymaking, working to look at some of the difficult questions of policymaking through an ethical lens. You are all experienced enough at this point to know that nothing is clear or easy when it comes to policymaking, especially when national security and foreign policy are involved. While this conference is focused on ethical governance, I'm going to talk about the idea of values-based foreign policy, which I think is actually part and parcel of ethical governance. In some ways, the notion of a values-based poli foreign policy has become a bit of a cliché, but I think it's a notion worth debating. What is a values-based foreign policy? Do we have one? Should we have one? I'd like to talk a bit about some general principles of a values-based foreign policy, and then bring in a few examples from my last assignment as U.S. Ambassador to Senegal and Guinea-Bissau. There's been a long debate, I think, between proponents of a values-based foreign policy and proponents of what some might call strategic interest-based policy. This is a fairly easy debate to have in an academic environment, but less easy in the field, as I will hopefully show you tonight. And let me preempt the argument that we sometimes put our values to the side for strategic interests. I know that. One can point to many cases of this over the history of our nation and even right now. But I want to draw on my personal experience for this evening's remarks not try to tackle the entire spectrum of our foreign policy around the world. We might still be sitting here at midnight if I did that. I think we as a country are better and our foreign policy is better when we connect policy directly to our values as a people. And let me take a shot at defining these values. We believe in universal human rights. People should be able to choose their form of government. They may not get exactly the government they personally want, or for that, ma that matter, that we want, but the process should be fair and transparent. We believe that governments should be accountable to their citizens. Everyone should have the right to live in a society that allows them to pursue their dreams. We believe that all citizens should be educated, not just boys and men. We believe in economic transparency and opportunity. We believe that women play a vital role in the social and economic development of a country and must not be prevented from reaching their full potential, something that we see too often around the world. We believe that climate change is a real threat to us and to future generations, and that a concerted, coordinated international effort is required to address this problem before it overwhelms us. We believe that American techno technological and scientific might should be used to alleviate poverty, suffering, and disease around the world. We in this country may not have figured out exactly how to put all this into practice perfectly yet, but that doesn't mean we don't strive toward that goal and shouldn't encourage other countries to also. There are gov other governments in the world, I'm thinking of China especially here, that like to respond to our criticisms on things like human rights, for example, by pointing out flaws in our society, things like high rates of imprisonment and sometimes difficult race relations. But here's the thing. I don't think there is a thoughtful, informed leader in this country who would argue that we don't have room for improvement, that we can't do better. The fact that we aren't perfect does not mean we don't have the right, even the obligation, to work with other nations to help make this world a better, safer place. I would like to now give three examples from my time in Senegal to tr of trying to incorporate values into our foreign policy. Two where I think we worked to promote our values, even when it was uncomfortable, and one where I probably opened myself up to criticism that I ignored our values. I'll start with the latter case, which concerned our policy in Guinea-Bissau. For those who don't know, Guinea-Bissau is a tiny country that shares a border with Senegal. Since its independence in 1973, which came after a long and violent rebellion against its former Portuguese masters, 
The country has been plagued by poverty and political instability. We closed our embassy there in 1998 during a violent civil war, and since then the U.S. ambassador to Senegal has been also accredited to Guinea-Bissau. No leader there has ever successfully completed his term in office, thanks to assassinations and coup d'etats. The country has had eight leaders in just the last 10 years. In January 2012, the president died, surprisingly of natural causes, and elections were scheduled but prevented by a military coup in April. So the question at the time was, do we, the U.S. government, interact with the coup-imposed transitional government or not? <clears throat> Many of my fellow ambassadors in Dakar also covered Guinea-Bissau, and we had long debates about this. The European, the European Union cut off aid and refused to recognize or talk with the government. We also cut off aid. We legally have to after coup d'etats. But I argued for engagement with the transitional government. This was an unpopular opinion and one that my European colleagues loved to point out to me was at odds with American values of democracy and transparent governance. I was already acutely aware of this. I didn't really need the British ambassador telling me this. But I felt strongly that engagement with the government had more potential to positively affect the country's political future than isolation. Two years after the coup, last June, the country held successful free and fair elections and democratically elected a new president. I tell you this story of, as an example of how promoting U.S. values through policy is not always a cut and dried proposition. In this case, I felt that our embassy team could better promote American values and encourage a return to democracy by engaging with what my EU friends called the illegitimate government than by further isolating them. And I like to think this was the right decision. Thus far, the new government has made strides toward improving the lives of the Salganans. Now to Senegal. For those who don't know, Senegal is the westernmost um, country in Africa, got its independence from France in 1960. When I arrived there in 2011, the country was gearing up for elections. Unlike Guinea-Bissau, Senegal is the only country in West Africa to have never experienced a coup d'etat. The country has a rich history of strong civil society and democracy. But this was threatened by then President Abdoulaye Wade nearing the end of his second term in office. Despite a constitutional two-term limit, Wad insisted on running for a third term. The country's constitutional court, made up of five Wad appointees who coincidentally got pay raises and brand new SUVs two weeks before they released their decision, ruled that he could run again. The country erupted in violence and a dozen people were killed in demonstrations between activists and police. In this case, my EU colleagues were rather quiet, happy to let the process play out. But I felt, and Washington agreed, that we should take a stronger and more vocal stance. As further background, the U.S. government, through USAID, was funding election observation training for domestic civil society groups across the country. Senegal has a long and well-established tradition of civil society observation of elections, one of the reasons elections have always been free and transparent there. My press team. By the way, my press officer's parents are here in the audience, and I just want a quick shout out to uh, Kathy and Bill. Um, great to see you. My press team scheduled a group interview with online media outlets. And during the interview, I said this. It is unfortunate that President Wad has chosen to undermine his many achievements and threaten Senegal's stability by insisting on running for a third term in office. His stature as one of the most experienced statesmen on the continent gives him the opportunity to spearhead the movement for democratic change by passing the torch to a new generation of leaders. So we are concerned, especially after the kind of violence we saw last week. This statement was widely reported the next morning and picked up by newspapers with sensational, quite sensational headlines. I received a phone call at 11 o'clock the next night from the foreign ministry convoking me to a meeting with the foreign minister. For those who are not fluent in diplomatese, being convoked is not a good thing. It's like being called to the principal's office. The foreign minister angrily accused me of meddling in Senegalese domestic politics and threatened to retaliate by banning domestic observation of the elections. I told him I stuck by my statement and encouraged him to carefully consider the possible consequences and in international reaction if they were to ban international or domestic election observers. I left that meeting uncertain of my future in Senegal. He had hinted that they might declare me persona non grata and kick me out of the country. They didn't. The next day, the palace called. President Wad wanted to see me, 
but he was out of town campaigning. He would be back later and I should stand by for a phone call. His office called at 9.45 that night and said he wanted to see me at 10.30. Down to the palace I went where I proceeded to be lectured at for two hours. In the interest of time, the main point was President Wad kept threatening to cancel, again, domestic observers and I kept telling him that the decision would be very poorly received in Washington and I guessed also in Brussels and other European capitals and would likely have serious consequences. He kept calling people into the meeting. At 11.30, he had his election minister woken up and brought in. The room was stifling hot. My two embassy assistants and I were sweating profusely, but no water was ever offered. Finally, at 12.30, we broke up the meeting with no decision made. Uh, but happily, later that week, Senegal did eventually decide to accredit the international observers. President Wad won the first round, but with less than 50% of the vote, forcing a runoff, which he lost to opposition leader Macky Sall. I was the first ambassador invited to meet with Macky Sall the day after the election, and then the first ambassador to meet with the new foreign minister a few weeks later. Our government's vocal support for democracy energized the Senegalese people. Even two years later, people would stop me on the street to thank me for America's support for democracy in Senegal, and led to the closest diplomatic and personal ties between our countries in a long time. A few months later, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visited Senegal, had a great and productive visit, and roughly a year later, Macky Sall was invited to the White House for a meeting with President Obama. At that meeting, President Sall invited Obama to Senegal, and sure enough, a few months later, in June 2013, President Obama spent two nights in Dakar at the beginning of his first long trip through Africa. And this leads to the second example of promoting a values-based foreign policy. I want to talk now about homosexuality in Africa, specifically in Senegal. But as you probably know, there have been a series of laws passed in various African nations over the last few years criminalizing homosexuality, in some cases with penalties as severe as death. Gay people in general are harassed and persecuted in most of Africa, and certainly in Senegal. Senegal's gay community is very much hidden, and gay people are threatened and even physically attacked, physically attacked if they display affection publicly. We at the American Embassy supported a, a small gay rights group there. One of the very first events that I participated in when I arrived in Senegal was the dedication of a new counseling and HIV testing center built by USAID for a gay Senegalese group. But this is a very culturally sensitive issue, and in the face of so many other bilateral issues, including the ones I just described, I will confess that I didn't press this topic very frequently or forcefully. In late June 2013, as President Obama was on Air Force One on his way to Senegal, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its decision striking down the Defense of Marriage Act, opening the door to the extension of federal benefits and rights to same-sex married partners. At the traditional bilateral press conference right after the meeting between Presidents Obama and Sal and their teams the next day, CNN's Jessica Yellen asked for Obama's reaction to this decision. She said, thank you, Mr. President. Will you comment generally on the historic nature of yesterday's rulings? Also, did you press President Sal to make sure that homosexuality is decriminalized in Senegal? And President Sal, may I ask you, sir, you just said you embrace democracy and freedom. As this country's new president, will you work to decrim decriminalize homosexuality in this country? President Obama gave what I thought was one of the most eloquent statements I've ever heard on the subject. I'm not going to read the entire quote, but please indulge me as I read some of his response, which I think speaks strongly to this notion of our values as a nation. So here's quoting President Obama. Well, first of all, I think the Supreme Court ruling yesterday was not simply a victory for the LGBT community. It's a victory for American democracy. I believe at the root of who we are as a people, who we are as Americans, is the basic precept that we are all equal under the law. We believe in basic fairness, and what I think yesterday's ruling signifies is one more step toward ensuring that those basic principles apply to everybody. When I spoke to Ms. Windsor, 83 years old, and I thought about the 40 years of her relationship and her partner who has now passed. For her to live to see this day where that relationship was a vehicle whereby more people receive their rights and are recognized as a testament to the love and commitment that they have made to each other, that was special. And that's just a microcosm of what it means for families and their children all across America. So it was a proud day, I think, for America. Now, this topic did not come up in the conversation that I just had with President Saul in our bilateral meeting, but let me make a general statement. The issue of gays and lesbians and how they're treated has come up and has been controversial in many parts of Africa. 
So I want the African people just to hear what I believe. And that is that every country, every group of people, every religion have different customs, different traditions. And when it comes to people's personal views and their religious faith, etc., I think we have to respect the diversity of views that there are. But when it comes to how the state treats people, how the law treats people, I believe that everybody has to be treated equally. I don't believe in discrimination of any sort. That's my personal view. And I speak as someone who obviously comes from a country in which there were times when people were not treated equally under the law, and we had to fight long and hard through a civil rights struggle to make sure that happened. So my, basi my basic view is that regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, when it comes to how the law treats you, how the state treats you, the benefits, the rights, and the responsibilities under the law, people should be treated equally. And that's a principle that I think applies universally, universally, and the good news is it's an easy principle to remember. Every world religion has this basic notion that is embodied in the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated, and I think it applies here as well. Then President Sal took the microphone. And he said this, and again, I'm going to quote um, what he said. Now, on the issue of homosexuality, Mr. President, you said something very important. General principles which all nations could share, and that is the respect for the human being and non-discrimination. But these issues are all societal issues, basically, and we cannot have a standard model which applies to all nations and all countries. You said it yourself, we all have different cultures. We have different religions. We have different traditions. We are not ready to decriminalize homosexuality. I've said that in the past, and at least for the time being, while we respect the rights of homosexuals, we are not ready to change the law. This does not mean that we are all homophobic, but society has to absorb these issues. It has to take time to digest them, bringing pressure to bear on them on such issues. It is just like capital punishment. In our country, we abolished it many years ago. In other countries, it is still the order of the day because the situation in the country requires it and we do respect the choice of each country. So please be assured that Senegal is a country of freedom and homosexuals are not being persecuted or prosecuted, but we must also respect the values and choices of Senegalese people. So this was a very clever, clever statement by President Sall. And believe me, every headline the next morning and every paper said basically, Macky Sall stands up to Obama. He got a huge boost in his approval ratings out of this. He was widely seen as rejecting American values and upholding traditional conservative African values. And his dig about the death penalty was a clever attempt to deflect the issue. In my mind, a little bit like comparing apples and oranges, but he made his point. But for me, President Obama's forceful defense of the importance of equality and non-discrimination against Africa's LGBT community was a green light to make this one of my last year's policy priorities. And as an ambassador, frankly, the closer you get to the end of your term in, in country, the more freedom you feel to be outspoken on issues. Um, at least I did. The threat of being kicked out of the country is a little bit less scary once you already have your plane ticket booked to go home. <laughs> anyway, we worked very closely that year with the Dutch Embassy, who did a lot of work on LGBT issues, um, and really to highlight the precarious nature of the, of the LGBT's community, of their place in society. I won't get into everything we did as an embassy, but in my last press conference, my last week in country, I wanted to make some statements as I was leaving. Um, and I made the following statement as part of the conference. I said, the second topic, one that is linked to leadership, is the advancement of human rights. Why am I talking to you about human rights when Senegal has a long and famous tradition of tolerance and, and inclusiveness? It's true, you are known for this. Your first president was a Christian. He and your second and third presidents had non-Muslim wives. You are truly a model for Muslim Christian understanding, participating in each other's religious celebrations, even marrying between religions without it being a big deal. Some would say the human rights issue of this generation is equal treatment for homosexuals. We are seeing this debate play out in some parts of Africa, in South Africa, in Uganda, in Cameroon. Even in Senegal, there is some room for discussion and debate. There was recently an attack on an exhibit about homosexuality in Africa at a cultural center here in Dakar. For Americans, this is a hot button issue and far from resolved. We know that Macky Sall told our own president that this issue will take time in Senegal. But I hope that Senegal's attitude of tolerance will grow and that this country will continue to be a leader in the region. Being a leader means taking a moral stand even when difficult or uncomfortable. Standing up to countries that are bullies or to infringements on human rights is being a le leader. 
and I think that this is an important leadership role for Senegal to fill in the future. Predictably, the Senegalese press was a little bit dismayed that I used my final press conference to push Senegal on its leadership and on its attitude toward LGBT rights. But I believe that this should now be part of our values-based foreign policy, the notion that all citizens of all countries deserve to be treated equally. Values-based foreign policy represents at the same time constant immutable values and values that shift and change as society does, itself does. When I joined the Foreign Service 26 years ago, gay foreign service officers had to hide their homosexuality lest they lose their security clearances. Nobody would have predicted that in 2013 the U.S. President would stand up in a press conference in West Africa and push for LGBT rights and equality. But the world changes, and as it does, our values need to change too. The overarching values that guide us as a nation and that define our foreign policies, values like universal suffrage, access to food and clean water, education and economic opportunity, remain constant. The challenge as a nation and as a government is to incorporate new values into values that have defined our nation for centuries. And when we do this and ensure that our values reflect the greatness of our country, our global leadership is stronger. Thank you.